handling medical procedures in the moment is a little bit different than the way we handle other worries. Handling the buildup, the anticipation of going to get a shot, going to the dentist, going to get a blood draw, we handle the same way. So it's a little bit of a two-step process. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, I'm going to say what I always say about how do we deal with the anticipation and the catastrophizing and the making it into an emergency about shots, doctor, blood draw, cavity. How do we handle that worry? The same way we handle all the worry. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. So, Robin, I actually get a lot of questions about this particular topic. I bet you do. I do. Yeah. And as you know, and if you don't know, listeners, you can go back and listen to the episode that we did about my family of fainters. My family, including my brother. My husband. Robin's husband. We don't handle medical things well historically. It's not an area in which we exhibit strength. (laughs) I was, yeah, strength, that's a better word than I was going to use. Yeah, but it is, yes, we we don't exhibit strength. In fact, we exhibit the epitome of weakness, one might say. Yeah, we don't even exhibit consciousness. But (laughs) you guys are passed out. We're passed out, yeah. We're very relaxed after we pass out. So anyway. I thought that we could do an episode on handling medical procedures because, one, people ask a lot about it. It's one of those things where, you know, people talk about needle phobia, difficulty getting shots, kids who have either the need to get normal vaccinations, like regular vaccinations, or sometimes you need a blood draw, and then also kids that have some sort of chronic issue where they have to undergo medical procedures or there's an illness or an injury comes up a lot in life. So it's not something that is just sort of a rare occurrence. So here's the thing, and everybody just bear with me. Handling medical procedures in the moment is a little bit different than the way we handle other worries. Handling the buildup, the anticipation of going to get a shot, going to the dentist, going to get a blood draw, we handle the same way. So it's a little bit of a two-step process. First of all, I'm going to say what I always say about how do we deal with the anticipation and the catastrophizing and the making it into an emergency about shots, doctor, blood draw, cavity. How do we handle that worry? The same way we handle all the worry. So we externalize it. We don't get into the content. We talk to it. If you are listening to this and you're thinking, what is Lynn talking about? Go back and listen to the Anxiety Disruptor series or go back and listen to any of the other episodes that we've done where I've talked about staying out of content. So you've got a child who's got to go to a doctor's appointment and they know they go for their wellness check on their birthday and their birthday is in March. And in January, right, they get through the holidays and on January 2nd, they start asking about, am I going to need a shot at the doctor? Am I going to need a shot at the doctor? What we want to do with that is we want to say, okay, here's your worry showing up, making this into an emergency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Same thing. Okay. That's number one. Number two, when you get to the doctor's office, or we actually just got a question about this on the podcast group, when you have to, because there are some circumstances where parents are supposed to do the medical procedure, they have to give a shot on a regular basis. That's less likely, but it happens. 
And then every parent had to stick a Q-tip up a child's nose to their brain. Oh, <laughs> yeah. right. Few years You're right. Too. You're right. This happened with the COVID test. That's exactly true. Yeah, I forgot about that whole thing. So when they have to get the procedure, so we're done with the anticipation and now it's going to happen. Then we want to do a few things differently that are enormously helpful. You know that I talk about the use of breathing and distraction with worry as in the category of elimination strategies. And so when we use breathing as a way to get rid of worried thoughts, when we use distraction as a way to get away from normal worry or stress, or when we play the game of if you do this thing, you won't feel worry, I'm not into that. Here's the exception. When you are in the process of getting a medical procedure, breathing and distraction have their place. And whenever I talk about breathing and distraction as these big elimination strategies that they're the only thing that you've learned to handle your worry, you'll hear me say, I am not against breathing and I'm not against distraction. They have their place. And in fact, if you listen to the recent episode that we did on sleep, Distraction at night in order to get your brain to unhook has its place. The ABC game that I talk about to fall asleep is actually a little distraction technique. So as we're talking about handling medical procedures, I want to go through how I would use breathing and distraction. And I'm going to throw another word in here, disconnection, as a tool, as a strategy to help your family navigate that. I just talked for a long time. <laughs> I was going to say, and I've used all these techniques and they work. <laughs> yeah, they do work. Yeah, they do work. Let me give you a concrete example of how this works. I had a client who was 18 and she was getting ready to go to college. In order to go to college, she had to get a certain series of immunizations as required by the college, you know, the meningitis, it was probably, you know, the standard thing. She needed to get probably the meningitis vaccine that she hadn't gotten yet. Very common for kids to get as they're going off to college. She had tried several times to go into the pediatrician's office to get her, her shot. This was really scary for her. She would react. She'd freak out. At one point, she was on the bottom floor of the pediatrician's office she was waiting for them to come in and give her the injection. She jumped out the window and ran away. It was pretty extreme. What? Yes, you heard me right. <laughs> you heard me right. She jumped out the window and ran away. I mean, she was on the bottom floor, but she was in, she was, you know, you know how they lead you, take you into the examination room and then you sit there and wait for a while. She, so she's she in there waiting to get her shot and the nurse is getting the shot ready and she jumped out the window and ran away. So it was a pretty desperate situation because she really wanted to go to college and she needed to get this immunization. She was having that internal battle that we talk about. So she came to see me and I taught her how to disconnect from her body, how to get out of the situation in her brain so that she could tolerate getting the shot. So we did some work so that she could, she learned about what her worry was, how it showed up. She didn't really have a lot of impairment in other areas, but this was a big one. She learned how to recognize what her brain was telling her, how her fight or fight system was getting fired off, how she was creating an emergency, et cetera, et cetera. It was a lot about what she was thinking in her imagination because the idea of it was grossing her out. I can totally relate to that. So I taught her all that stuff. So she knew in terms of education, what was going on. And then I just taught her this technique and I made her a recording so she could listen to it in practice that when she went into the doctor's office, when she was in the examination room about to get her injection, that she would close her eyes, use that amazing imagination to disconnect and go elsewhere while she left her arm there for the nurse to give the injection. So this is a strategy, a technique that we use a lot, for example, with people who are experiencing chronic pain, the ability to disconnect. Technically, oftentimes it's called dissociation, which people freak out when they hear that term. Dissociation is not all bad. If you use it in a way that helps, it really helps. But this was what we did. So she went into the doctor's office. I actually went with her because the clock was ticking. 
We went into the doctor's office, told the nurse to just hang out for a second. I went in, gave her the cues that she needed, reminded her of what she needed to do. She had been listening to the recording. She had been practicing. She was able to close her eyes. I forget where she went, you know, to the beach or someplace that she enjoyed. We left her arm there and her mind and the rest of her body in her imagination went elsewhere. The nurse came in, put on the alcohol on her arm and gave her the injection. Success. Off she went. I would assume, I haven't heard from her since, so I would assume that she went off to college and she was able to manage that. That's amazing. Let's talk about this when we come back. Okay. Making the step to talk to someone can feel big sometimes. It needn't be so complicated, people. The research is really clear that therapy helps. Talkspace makes it easy to take that step and to find a therapist you like. Once you make that move to get help, you will experience a difference. And seeing a therapist or psychiatrist can be affordable and convenient. By doing everything online, Talkspace has made getting the help you want easy, accessible, and affordable. Therapy can help you shift your perspective, find tools to cope with difficult situations, and of course, help you build important skills. Getting started is the important part, and Talkspace makes it easy and affordable. At Talkspace.com, you can sign up online and get a personalized match with the provider that's right for you, typically within 48 hours. It's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions with your licensed therapist from the comfort of your home. You won't miss time at work or have to line up childcare. It's mental health care made easy. Talkspace lets you send messages to your therapist so you don't have to wait for your next session. It's the number one online therapy platform with licensed therapists in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, substance use, relationship issues. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace when you go to Talkspace.com and use code FLUSTER. To match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and use code FLUSTER to get $100 off. That's FLUSTER at Talkspace.com. Go to Talkspace.com and use code FLUSTER to get $100 off your first month. I'll tell you what one of my New Year's resolutions was. It was to reduce our takeout spending. So choose everyplate.com like we have to save money while enjoying quick and satisfying meals. At first, I was skeptical, honestly, thinking that these meal kits might be expensive. But now I'm convinced you get the same deliciousness at a much lower price. Meals are 25% cheaper than grocery shopping, so you can count on great value week after week. Plus, you only pay for what you need and pre-portioned ingredients. I'm very charmed by the little tiny sizes of things that come in each of our kits. <laughs> well, whatever floats your boat, Robin. Every plate provides plenty of delicious variety, so your taste buds never get bored. That's one of the things that we like about it is, you know, you get into kind of ruts with the way that you cook and the flavors that you use. It really is just a nice way to change up the tasty, delicious, affordable recipes to choose from. I just love how it changed our dinner dynamic. I'm no longer the only cook. Every plate meals are so easy and delicious that my kids and my husband joined in and we all cook the meals now. So you guys can be like Robin and get the whole family involved. Get started with every plate for just $1.49 per meal by going to everyplate.com slash podcast and entering the code FLUSTER149. That's everyplate.com slash podcast and enter the code FLUSTER149. That's up to $110 value. Okay, we're back. So, this disassociation technique, if I'm not mistaken, since I'm not a mental health provider, don't trauma survivors use it? And especially even in the in the act of experiencing trauma, like our brains tend to do this naturally mm -hmm. as a defense mechanism? Correct. Sometimes even as a survival mechanism. So the term dissociation has a lot of connection. When people are experiencing trauma, part of the therapy that they're working on is to recognize that they're doing this and to reconnect. Because as helpful as this dissociation is when you're a child, for example, or even an adult experiencing trauma, if you continue to do it after the trauma is done, if that becomes sort of the way that you manage 
or the way that you're trying to tolerate difficult memories or difficult emotions. We want to help you work through that. So dissociation is problematic when it is a leftover of trauma. This is a simple way of saying it. But when you're using it as a way to avoid or escape when you're no longer in trauma, it is absolutely a thing that we do when we're in trauma because it helps. But here's the little caveat to this. The ability to dissociate or use the word disconnect, right? The word disconnect is great too. The ability to disconnect when it is helpful to disconnect And when you're doing it on purpose can be really, really positive. So if you have chronic pain, if you have ringing in your ears, if you have to undergo medical procedures, so kids with cancer, for example, that have to undergo chemotherapy or even lumbar punctures or kids with medical conditions that they need an injection on a regular basis. I've had clients who are experiencing that. The ability to disconnect, the ability to go elsewhere is really, really helpful. Is that also part of what people are doing, childbirth preparation? Sure. Is that also part of it too, where we think of where where else we go as we're working through those contractions? Yeah. So that's a very good example because the front loading that we do ahead of time for childbirth is that we want women to understand what's happening in their bodies So as they're experiencing different things and different sensations, they know what's going on and we normalize it and we make it okay. And when we talk about using hypnosis in childbirth or whatever term you want to use, visualization, all that kind of stuff, what we really are doing is we're helping them normalize what their body is going through so that they don't treat it like an emergency and their body can do what their body knows how to do. Yeah. So we're dissociating, we're disconnecting, we're saying, I'm going to let my body birth this baby, and I'm going to go off somewhere else. And so it might be that you have the image of sort of going under a wave. If you like to be in the water, you know, you're you're going under a beautiful wave as it goes over you, all that kind of stuff that you use. Fun fact about Lynn. Yeah. She loved doing hypnotherapy for pregnant women for a period. I did. I did that actually during my mommy break. That's kind of what I did when I was sort of retired from being a therapist. I was really working a lot with pregnant women to decrease fear and anxiety around childbirth and allow them to use some of these strategies to have a better experience. So yeah, I used it myself and was there for Robin too, which was very cool. Both times. Both times. Yeah. And I was there for me both times. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So pretty cool. She's like the family therapist and the family doula. (laughs) Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. I wear many hats. It's the same concept. And it's a really positive experience. The other thing, too, you want to think about is that when people are dissociating because of trauma, it feels very out of control. It feels very scary. It feels very disconnected in not such a great way. But when you teach kids how to do this because they need a medical procedure or in childbirth, it is a very positive experience because you are actively deciding, you are making a choice, you are practicing how to use this innate skill that we all have because it's built into us. Let me ask you this. So you have a Mm seven-year-old who for medical reasons now has to undertake more routine interventions. When you start talking about this skill of disassociation or disconnection, how do you talk about it with them? What's the language you prefer to introduce the concept? So I would say, okay, so here's the thing. Because you have this fill in the blank, right? It means that you have to go and get blood drawn once a month, or you have to get an injection once a week. And I'll tell you, nobody has ever said to me, woohoo, I get to have blood drawn, or I get to go get an injection, right? So let's just put that on the table. This is not something that you want or something that is generally considered pleasant, but you're going to have to handle it. So I'm going to teach you because you have an incredibly imaginative brain I'm going to teach you how it is that we can use your imagination to be able to handle this, even though you don't want it, I get it, but it's necessary, how you can handle this in a way that actually is going to kind of make you feel like a superhero. And so then what I would teach is I would have them practice going off in their imagination to a place that they want to go. And it could be to the beach. It could be playing Legos. It could be running around in their backyard with their golden retriever, right? Doesn't matter to me. 
It could be a fictional place. It could be that they're going to go take a space trip to Mars. It could be that they're going to Hogwarts. It could be, it doesn't matter. And I teach them, I say, look, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to teach you how to leave the part of you here that we need in order to do this procedure while the rest of you gets to go off somewhere else. And I will explain to them that this is a really common thing that people do. And people even do it in other ways. Like say you're sitting in a really boring class and you have to listen to somebody talk about something on and on and on. And you just let yourself daydream and you let yourself go off to somewhere else. We've all had that experience. How about when you're on a long car ride and you don't have a screen in front of you and you're just looking out the window and you're just taking yourself on an adventure? That would be the language that I use. The goal is to manage the discomfort. The goal is to manage the needle or to manage the blood draw or to manage whatever the process is. The goal is to manage that. And people are going to do that on the outside. So they maybe are going to put some of that numbing cream on your arm. They're going to help you. The people who are helping you with this are going to help you manage it on the outside. And you get to manage it on the inside. So it's a combination of the grown-ups really helping you and supporting you and you learning how to help and manage and use your incredibly imaginative brain to support yourself, to help yourself. I've heard you note this twice now in this episode where you're, you're specifically stating that a certain part of you stays there. So why do you say that? And it makes it sound like someone's just going to like disappear off into another world or something. (laughs) It's starting to sound science fiction-y. Tell me. So the reason that I'm saying that is because if I set it up that a child who's getting a shot will not feel anything, then I'm setting them up to fail. Because somebody is going to come in, they're going to put the cold alcohol swab on their arm. I want them to recognize that this procedure is going to happen. They're going to feel some things. What we're doing is we're compartmentalizing it. So they're really only going to feel this sensation in one little part of them while the rest of them can go away. Because if I say to them, look, you're going to go completely somewhere else and you're not going to have any knowledge or you're not going to have any awareness of what's going on. We're going to send you to the moon and you're going to get the shot. That can freak people out. And also that's just a high bar. So I want them to be able to recognize that, you know, we're going to just leave your arm here. Your arm's going to get the shot and you and your imagination can go to the beach. That's just setting it up a little bit so that I'm not saying, oh, you won't feel anything. Because sometimes people do do that. They say, we're going to give you a shot and you won't feel a thing. That to me is a setup. That's bad global language. That's bad global language. That's right. So if I say, you may feel some sensation, you may feel some discomfort. We stay away from the word pain, right? You may feel some sensation. You may feel some discomfort. I could also say, you might be surprised how little that you feel. You might be surprised how you don't even notice it at all. I could say that and put that in there. But what I'm really trying to do in this is to give this child permission. We want to normalize it going in and give them permission to shift their focus in a way that allows them to get through this procedure, right? So we say in the biz, what you focus on, you amplify. So the more that we talk about it, the more that we use the language of pain, the more that we make it into this this emergency, the more that that amygdala is going to get fired up. And we all know when the amygdala is open for business, it makes being able to handle anything more difficult. It really becomes a pretty amazing strategy to use with kids. And I will tell you, it is used in emergency rooms all the time. It is used on pediatric oncology units. It is used in skilled pediatricians and skilled nurses do this all the time. They may not use the language I use to describe it, but they are using distraction, disconnection. If we want to go clinical, they're using dissociation as a way to help kids manage what is a medical procedure that they have to have. When we come back, let's talk about how a parent can manage this before that skill has been 
practiced and learned because, you know, obviously it takes practice. So, so let's talk about where we start. Okay. Here's something you might've never thought about. Why does laundry detergent come in massive plastic jugs? Who wants that? Those inconvenient, awkward, heavy jugs are filled with messy goo and they're up to 90% water. Washing machines already use water. So why would we pay more for it? Not to mention 91% of those jugs don't get recycled. 700 million detergent jugs wind up in our landfills every single year. That's why I'm obsessed with EarthBreeze laundry detergent sheets. Yeah, me too. EarthBreeze laundry detergent echo sheets, they look like dryer sheets, but they're not. They dissolve 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold, and it couldn't be easier. No measuring or mess, you just toss them in. EarthBreeze has really made the whole concept of detergent better. The packing is compact, it's biodegradable and plastic-free. Their eco sheets are vegan, cruelty-free, and safe for sensitive skin. They offer flexible subscriptions that can be adjusted, paused, or canceled by you at any time without penalty. And with their Buy One, Give 10 initiative, each purchase donates 10 loads of detergent to a charitable cause of your choice. When our first package arrived and I saw the simplicity of these little laundry detergent sheets, I kept wondering why no one had thought of this before. I mean, it's just so convenient. Now's the time to try EarthBreeze because right now our listeners can subscribe and save 40%. So go to earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks to get started. earthbreeze.com slash flusterclucks for 40% off. If you don't like it, EarthBreeze will give you a full refund. You don't even have to send it back. They're confident you'll love it as much as we do. And we really do. As you know, I don't have a daughter, I have sons, but I played a lot of sports and I still play a lot of sports. I've witnessed a lot of people trying to support their daughters. Being on the sidelines as a parent can be a tricky place to be. That's why we've partnered with elite competitor coach, Brianne Smedley. She's host of the Elite Competitor Podcast and she's sponsoring this episode. As moms, it is so hard to watch our athlete daughters struggle on the court or the field. As your daughter is playing sports, you want her to enjoy the game. You want her to be able to handle mistakes and bounce back from mistakes. You want her to recognize and absorb the things she did well. And then for some families, it's about helping your daughter level up and maybe even get recruited. Christina and Brienne work with moms and their athlete daughters to build confidence, level up performance, and build resiliency all through the sports they love. Their sisters-in-law, hey, like us. Like us. Sisters-in-law are the best. Female champions and elite performance coaches. Brianne created a free training specifically for moms of athlete daughters. This training takes the guesswork of how to help her build her confidence and mental game to be her biggest strengths in her sport and in life. And you know, I'm all about building skills that help us be flexible and confident and manage what life throws at you. Are you ready to learn how to strengthen your athlete daughter's mental game? You want her to believe in herself as much as you do. So go to trainhergame.com slash fluster to access the free training. Okay, let's get back to this conversation. So Lynn, my question is that parents can hear this and say, this makes sense, but obviously this is going to take some practice. It's going to take conversations, but you have to start somewhere. And realistically, you're probably going to have to start where the child is somewhat panicking in a medical environment. What are the skills that you can start introducing in that moment? Because many parents find themselves here. So two things. One is that if you have a child who really has big reactions to medical procedures, you really do want to front load this. Because they know they're going to get a shot. I mean, there are times when a you know child falls down and needs stitches and off you go and you don't have time to practice it. But if it's a needle phobia, if it's a regular medical procedure, you do want to start ahead of time because learning it in the moment is pretty difficult. So you can do all the things that I'm talking about ahead of time. If you are dealing with it in the moment, if you're needing to get stitches, if it's something unexpected and here it comes, this is where breathing and distraction are going to be your friends. So you want to work on taking slow breaths. Remember, I don't say deep breaths because when you're panicking, it's hard to get a deep breath and then people panic because they can't get a deep breath. But you want to focus on slow breaths and you want to focus on 
putting their attention elsewhere. So distraction. So it would be okay in this moment, right? We're going to take four slow breaths. I'm going to take them with you. Don't make it complicated, right? You don't have to breathe in, hold, blah, 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 blah. Slow breaths. We're going to breathe in. I'm going to count to four. And then we're going to exhale. We're going to take four slow breaths. And I'm going to give you my phone. I'm going to give you something to look at. I'm going to distract you. And while you're doing this, what you want to say out loud to your child is that right now, your poor little brain thinks that you're in an emergency. And we're going to give your brain some messages to let it know we got this to let it know that you can handle this. We're going to do this right now. And the way we're going to give your brain those messages is we're going to slow down our breathing. We're going to give your brain a little something to get occupied with. So we're going to use a little distraction. It is hard to do this in the moment. Once the amygdala has been fired off, remember, there's not an off switch. We can't recall all of that norepinephrine and epinephrine that's just been pumped into the system. So the more you can do it ahead of time, the better. But those are two very good strategies to use in the moment. I have seen videos of skilled emergency room physicians giving kids stitches after they've got an injury using these strategies. And it is remarkable, not surprising to me, but it is remarkable how skillful these medical people are with their language when they're aware of using this strategy. And it's very, very common in places where pediatric procedures are done on a regular basis. That's also the point is that these surgeons have a lot of practice. They do. It's a skill they get to exercise several times a day, so they've mastered it. Right. And I've also seen people who haven't mastered the skill, who really should learn this skill, right? So everybody who's working in a pediatric environment where they're having to do procedures should know this skill. Absolutely. But I've seen people not have the skill because nobody has ever taught it to them. But let me say this. It is not that hard. My goal is always to say to parents, don't make this more complicated. So it's really simple If you go into it with a little bit of practice, you can even write out what you're going to say. You can talk to your child ahead of time. You can practice it. Don't be overwhelmed or think, oh, well, I can't do this because I'm not an expert or I haven't practiced it or I don't know exactly what to say. Lynn knows exactly what to say or Dr. Jellybeans knows exactly what to say, but I don't know what to say. It's okay. Remember that the core component is, is that you are allowing your imagination to take you elsewhere. The other thing that's really, really important about this, and this was part of the question that the parent posted on the Facebook group, is that she was having a lot of anxiety about how she was going to handle it. And one of the things we know is that a parent's response to pain, to injury, to any procedure, a parent's response is oftentimes more impactful than the actual sensations that the child is experiencing. So we all know that, like little kid falls down, stands up, when a parent goes, oh my God, right? So you have to really work on being able to manage your own response to this. Fake it until you make it. You may have to take your own deep breaths. If you're like me, my son broke his elbow, he was fine, I passed down in the pediatrician's office. Okay. So I know what I'm talking about and I I feel your pain. I feel your figurative pain in this. So the more that you can work as a team with your child and the more that you can model this, the better off you'll be. And with older kids too, or even adults, a skill that you taught me is in distraction is like you're driving someone to surgery. And didn't you tell me once to to talk about music and to talk about lyrics and to get them. It's, it's like the alphabet game in that sense, but why don't you talk about that too? Yeah. So you can say to your child, you can coach your child or your spouse, how to pull them out of the catastrophic video that they're watching. And we want, remember that when you're in that place of panic, when you're in that place of freak out, we want that prefrontal cortex to get back online but we also want to connect them to something that pulls them out of that catastrophic movie. 
So it may be that you, you know, you pull up lyrics of a song that you start singing together, something that you have practiced or a a silly song that, you know, you start talking about a particular episode of a show that they like. So you pull that imagination to another place. This is really about how our imagination takes over for better or for worse and being able to harness the power of a child's imagination or an adult's imagination, a teenager's imagination, so that it pulls them out of that panicky, catastrophic movie that they're watching and regulates their body. We want to give the brain messages that you're not in an emergency. So you can do it by breathing for sure. Sometimes it's by movement. That's okay too. And by pulling yourself into something that you know brings you pleasure, brings you joy, that's something that you like thinking about. So all of that stuff in the moment is really helpful. We're trying to activate and deactivate different parts of us and connect and disconnect. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? So I talked about disconnection. We want to disconnect. I'm going to disconnect from the sensation. I'm going to disconnect from the arm. I'm going to disconnect from what you're imagining happens when you get a shot because it's the idea that freaks people out. And we want to connect to the things that are either pleasurable or interesting or fun, calming, all that stuff. And one of the ways actually when I'm thinking about doing therapy is that I'm always thinking in my head, actually, what do I want to connect this person to and what do I want to disconnect them from? So say I'm working with a parent that's really, really anxious about their child riding their bike. I want to connect them to the part of their parenting that's very encouraging and wants their child to have fun. And I want to disconnect them from that catastrophic part that's imagining horrible things happening. I'm always thinking about that. So this is just another way in which I use that tool in a very concrete way during medical procedures to connect or disconnect. What's kind of interesting is that you reference the alphabet game at the beginning because in our sleep episode that we just had, and you've talked about it before, The alphabet game just keeps the prefrontal cortex online just enough so that you don't go down a ruminating path that can keep you awake. What's interesting is that I, you know, I try the alphabet game now that you mentioned it, but prior to you talking about it, my own preference of how I would get to sleep to prevent the rumination was more of this. I would, I, because I'm in travel, I always have a next trip. I would imagine myself on the next trip. And I would break it down into all these parts of like, here I am at the airport, here I am boarding the plane, here I am this, and then it just knocks me out. But so I think it's important to see these skills outside the content, right? Like, cause you're always, it's not about the content. It's that ability to unhook and to hook onto something better. Right. The thing about this that I think is really helpful is that you should just tell your child. Yes. What you're doing. Yeah. This is a really cool skill that we're going to practice. And it's super, super handy in this context. One time, a long time ago, I was running through my living room and I ran into the leg of a very solid table. You know that when you hit your toe and your little toe separates from the rest of your toes, it hurt so bad. I probably broke my toe. My little toe is probably broken. So I smash my toe. I break my toe. I'm like, ah, I fell down on the floor in my living room. My boys were little at the time. And I was like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And they go, what happened, mommy? What happened? I go, I just ran into the table with my toe. It hurts so bad. And then I said to them, hold on a second. I'll be right back. And I just closed my eyes and I took a few slow breaths and I went to the top of Great Northern, which is a mountain in Montana. That is incredible that my husband and I hiked up a few times way back when. And I said, I'll be right back. And I just closed my eyes, just took some breaths. And I just went to the top of Great Northern. And I just hung out there for a few minutes. My toes still hurt. I needed to calm my body down because my body was freaking out. I just wish this podcast were on video right now because I just realized my face. I'm just like looking at you like, who are you? <laughs> what do you mean? You know that I do that stuff. I yeah. mean, it's, it's, it's impressive. I'll just say that. I mean, it's impressive when you are aware of all the tools at your disposal. Yeah. 
you know, this is a tool that I have had to use a lot because of my squeamish fainting. Oh, that's true. Yeah. But then in the flip side, which we won't get into in this, is that then I also, in order to stop my squeamish fainting, I had to be on offense with this thing too, because if I'm sitting with a client and they're talking to me about their broken arm, I couldn't be like, one moment, please. And then lie down on the floor. You know, I couldn't say to them like, I'll be right back. I'm going to Great Northern. I had to bump it up. And those are more advanced things that I use. And now I'm on offense with this thing. So with my squeamish fainting, I on purpose expose myself to it. But at the beginning, I could couldn't do that, but now I can. I switched gears early on into it once I got my confidence a little bit. So now when I'm giving blood, I actually watch what they're doing. I ask questions. I get very engaged in it. Maybe when I first gave blood, I would have used this more disconnection technique. I don't use that anymore for my squeamish fainting, but that's another episode. That's just me sort of taking it up a notch because of what I do for a living and being able to do that. If listeners are curious, because your family, you know, your biological family has such issues with this, I made sure I was the only parent present when my kids had to give blood the first time, non-events. Right. So it can be non-events too. But And I just knew that my husband, who really hates drawing blood, like, why would I have him there for that reason? Exactly. No need. And for me, like needles and blood... Like, that's not a thing for me. For me, it's, as I've talked about, it's broken bones. It's people, and it's actually people talking about broken bones. So that's why I fainted at my son's, when my son broke his elbow, because the pediatrician started telling me which bones weren't where they were supposed to be. And then down I went. I forbid you to read any story about Jeremy Renner's snowplow accident. Yeah, but that's what I do now is that I will purposely, you, you shouldn't forbid me. You should challenge me. You should say, you have to read this because that's the exposure that I do now. Yeah, because he broke 30 bones. I saw 30 bones. Yeah, poor guy. Ouch, a Rooney. A friend of mine just posted on Facebook, her little girl fell off the bars or the beam or something at gymnastics and broke her elbow. And she posted it and she used to babysit for my kids, actually. Now she's a mom herself. And she posted it and there were the x-rays, the pictures of the elbow. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at that. I'm going to expose myself on purpose to that because that's what I do now. But you don't have to do that with your kid who's afraid to get a shot. Right. You don't have to sit and watch video after video of kids getting injections because it doesn't happen that often. This strategy, this tool of being able to disconnect on purpose is really, really helpful. What is it that you say? I'll be right back. I'll be right back. Yeah. You're just like sitting there with your <laughs> eyes closed. <laughs> I was lying on the floor and there, and I can, I wish, like, I so wish this is before video cameras around. I wish that there was someone just videoing them. Like, are they just standing there? Like, you know, in their like little sneakers, just like, okay. Yeah, they're looking at you and they're like, I guess that phrase isn't what we thought it meant. <laughs> yeah, right. Because she's, she's still- right there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I think I explained it to him when I came back. I said, I just took my brain to the top of Great Northern. The other funny thing that happened, you know, I used to do all of this. I still love doing it. I just don't do it as much, but working with pregnant women in childbirth and that kind of stuff. And my son was probably little, little I was doing this. So he was probably like two and a half or three. He had a lisp and he said, so why do you need your computer to have a baby? I go, a computer to have a baby? And he goes, yes, you're always saying, relax your computerist, relax your computerist. (laughs) (laughs) And he just took the word computer and uterus and smashed them together in the best way. It was so cute. Yeah. Relax your computerist. Yeah, it's very funny. (laughs) We laughed. Yeah. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. Are you overwhelmed by the things that get in the way of you doing what you want to do? Are you looking for ways to simplify life to better align with your values? Do you want to create space in your schedule so you have room for more of the good stuff? play, joy, relationships, gratitude, and more? If you answered yes to any of these questions, I invite you to check out Edit Your Life, a podcast to help you edit the unnecessary from your life so you have more room to enjoy the awesome. Through episodes with me, Christine Ko, and a range of super smart, compassionate, and thoughtful guests, you'll come away with big picture insights and practical ways to declutter your home, schedule, and mental space without getting bogged down by perfection. 
I have always believed that small moments and actions matter tremendously. My goal is to help you find agency and space in your life through doable baby steps that will leave you feeling accomplished instead of overwhelmed. Check out Edit Your Life wherever you enjoy your podcasts.